Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Transcendental Fiction where we're looking at Virginia Woolf's short story, uh, Solid Objects. So we've already seen uh, quite a bit of the story, we've read it and we've seen and discussed some of the um, uh, fundamental themes that the story uh, is dealing with. So just to very quickly summarize what we've discussed so far. So this particular uh, short story is about a transition from a mainstream narrative of productivity and promises and careers uh, to um, more uh, interesting narrative, a more irrational narrative perhaps of a fetish for broken objects, a fetish for solid objects, right? And this fetish obviously is part of the irrational desire, uh, but in a way it also becomes interestingly uh, a mimicry of some sort uh, of an original imperial fetish, right? And this is something we will talk about a little bit today in this lecture. Because when we see that uh, John, who is the protagonist in the story, he, he suddenly departs from his career, uh, a very promising career as a politician, he suddenly departs from there into uh, becoming essentially a collector of broken objects. The entire fantasy about objects, the entire fantasy about picking up unknown objects, uh, in a way possessing them, uh, that could be seen as a mimicry of the original imperial fantasy. Uh, which is obviously outdated now, which is obviously something which does not work anymore in the context of this particular story. Uh, and because it does not work anymore, uh, it, it is seen as irrational and bizarre and strange and is almost punished uh, for having that fetish, for having that fantasy, right. But it is very much a mimicry of the original imperial masculinist narrative, okay. And that is something which we should pay some attention to, okay. So, um, and, and, and we will see how he becomes this sort of irrationally drawn to his objects which do not have a name, which have sort of surpassed or crossed or exhausted the use value or functional value, right. So, these are objects which are essentially post purpose objects, a post value objects, a post use objects. Uh, and in that sense, they become uh, like things. So, if you are using thing theory, which I mentioned already, uh, Bill Brown and there are other people that you can read also. So, the enti entire idea of thing theory says that you know the whole idea of thing is something which is not an object anymore. In other words, something which is which cannot be uh, which cannot be a part of the normal or normative consumption production economy anymore. It is outside uh, the consumption production economy, right? So, these objects which John uh, finds himself attracted to uh, are outside. Uh, the mainstream production consumption economy, right? And, and uh, he picks up these objects as a some kind of private fetish. Uh, but these are objects which are, uh, which should generally be considered to be useless by uh, normal other people, quote unquote normal normative people. So the non-normative quality of objects is exactly what makes them things so if you are using present day thing theory into them. Okay, uh, and this is something which we will see as we move on and we will read, uh, this should be on the screen. Uh, anything uh, so long as it was an object of some kind more or less round, perhaps with a dying flame deep sunk in its mass, anything china, glass, amber, rock, marble, even a smooth oval uh, egg of a prehistoric bird would do. He took also to keep his eyes to, to, to keeping his eyes upon the ground, especially in the neighborhood of wasteland where the household refuse is thrown away. And this is something which we have discussed already, but then just to recap a little bit before we move on to the next bit. The whole idea of the fact that he is inhabiting the wasteland, he is in inhabiting rubbish heaps uh, is something which is interesting over here because as I mentioned already, waste is something which is a part of the production process. So, waste is something which is produced uh, and waste obviously is post consumption. So, waste is something which, it, which, it, which becomes after the consumption process is complete. Right, when you consume something completely, then it becomes a waste. Now, again, uh, he is inhabiting those sites, those spaces, which are spaces of post consumption, of post value, of post purpose, and is picking up objects from there. He is hoping uh, to find similar objects over there in those places. Uh, so, essentially, he is becoming uh, symbolically a rack picker, and uh, I think I may have mentioned this already. Uh, the transition that he exhibits away is from a bourgeois walker. Uh, a, a genteel walker, a gentleman walker with a walking stick to a rack picker with a sticker picker's uh, stick, right. So, the stick symbolically uh, makes this has a change because uh, it, it has a transition from a normal 
expensive, presumably expensive, privileged walking stick uh, to a stick which has a wire net attached to it just to facilitate the picking up of objects. So he becomes from a Fanua to a rack picker and that, that transition is obviously quite sim symbolic and quite uh, uh, spectacular in quality. Okay, such objects often occur there, thrown away of uh, no use to anybody, shapeless, discarded. So again, the whole idea of discarded objects, so shapeless objects, so abundant objects become important because as we have mentioned already, uh, the bigger narrative of abundant over here is he abundance is political project he, and so politics be damned uh, becomes a very ironically uh, prophetic statement in the story where politics is essentially damned, is abandoned, is thrown away, is discarded um, and is something which he you know, does away with entirely. In a few months, he had collected four or five specimens that, look, that took their place upon the mantelpiece. They were useful too for a man who was standing for parliament upon the brink of a brilliant career, has any number of papers to keep in order, addresses to constituents, declarations of policy, appeals for subscriptions, invitations to dinner and so on. So again, uh, there is almost a parodic significance over here because the, the omniscient writer is telling us that uh, you know those objects that John is picking up is perhaps purposeful, uh, are perhaps purposeful because he obviously has a lot of important papers, important documents that need paperweights on them. So these objects which are picked up from uh, trash places, from waste places, etc., are useful in terms of keeping uh, the other objects uh, uh, in order, the papers, important papers in order. So the mantelpiece becomes a very interesting space over here where this non-functional objects uh, are juxtaposed with the functional objects and non-functional objects appear to have some kind of functionality only in so far as they are uh, as sort of keeping the uh, other functional objects in order. But when we find in the story is gradually uh, the entire mantelpiece becomes full of this quote unquote non-functional objects or things, discarded things, abundant things, uh, you know, forgotten things, uh, trash, waste. Uh, and the functional objects disappear from the mantelpiece and that obviously is again very symbolic like the symbolic walking stick becoming the rack picker's instrument, the mantelpiece becoming something else from a functional space to a non-functional space again uh, becomes symbolic of the transition that takes place in the story uh, from being someone with a promising political career to a rack picker in a metropolis. And this section which we will study today now uh, is useful, is very, very helpful because it is a very dramatic section and it is a very symbolic section as well. And uh, there it is, it should be on the screen. One day, starting from his rooms in the temple to catch a train in order to address his constituents, his eyes rested upon a remarkable object lying half hidden in one of those little borders of grass which etched the basis of vast legal buildings. So again, um, as I may have mentioned, uh, you know, there is a curious juxtaposition between functional objects, functional buildings, uh, mainstream meaningful sites and non-meaningful sites. So he sees a remarkable object half hidden, so again it is very liminal in quality, it is hidden at the same time as it is also visible, so it is a question this combination of visibility and invisibility makes it half hidden, again very liminal in quality. And where is that object on the little borders of grass which etch the basis of vast legal buildings. So again this is the temple, the temple is a place where they understand where they practice and learn law, so it is quite literally the site of law, the site of the legal monument where everything is classified and uh, you know standardized uh, and made meaningful and legislated, right. So in, in that place he sees a little object half hidden in the grass which grows in the borders of those buildings. So it, literally no man's land between legal buildings is where the object is lying. Again very, very symbolic space. So it is a no man's land between legal buildings. So that, that space becomes literally a non-legal space where the object is lying and he is obviously going there to pick it up. He can only touch it with the point of a stick to the railing. So it is in the railing, so it is literally like a barbed wire kind of a thing, uh, barbed wire no man's land between uh, two classified territories and it is trying to reach that no man's land uh, with a stick uh, but is failing to do it each time. And so the walking stick becomes very symbolically inadequate uh, to pick up that object. So he is about to turn that into something else. The walking stick is about to become something else over here as we will see in a moment. Okay, he can only touch it with the point of a stick to the railings, but he could see that it was a piece of china of the most remarkable shape, as nearly resembling a starfish as anything, shaped or broken accidentally into five irregular but unmistakable points. So again, the brokenness is what appeals to him and that is exactly the point of the story. Uh, the brokenness or the meaninglessness is what makes it uh, so irresistible to him in an quote unquote irrational way.
The coloring was mainly blue, but, but green stripes of spots of some kind overlaid the blue, and lines of crimson gave it a richness and luster of the most attractive kind. John was determined to possess it, but the more he pushed, the further it receded. At length, he was forced to go back to his rooms and improvise a wire ring attached to the end of the stick, with which, by dint of great care and skill, he finally drew the piece of china within reach of his hands. So again, the fact that he attached the wire ring to this stick symbolically makes it a rack picker's instrument. The stick now becomes no more a gentleman's instrument, but a rack picker's instrument, and is now able to retrieve or get, not retrieve, but get uh, the broken object which he was uh, desiring for, that he was, he was attracted to. Okay, as he seized hold of it, he exclaimed in triumph. So it's like a personal victory. So again, this is very, very fetishistic in quality. It's, uh, you know, he is drawn to it in an irrational desire, in an irrational fantasy, and now that he's got it, he's almost exclaiming in triumph. At that moment, the clock struck. So very, very symbolic again. So as you can see, that a space that is inhabiting now is between the legal buildings. So it's literally the no man's land, literally and symbolically the no man's land. Also, uh, in the time in which is going there, that is outside the clock time. So, you know, it literally becomes a space time outside the space time narrative, the normative narrative of space time. So it is quite literally the space time outside the normative narrative. Now, the moment it gets to the object, the, the clock, the standard clock, the clock time begins to chime. Uh, which is say that it is sort of brought back in clock time, standardized time, legal time, classified time, right? However, that also reminds him that he's failed to make his appointment, that he will fail to go there, he won't show up in time. It was out of the question that he should keep his appointment. So the appointment, the important functional appointment is now lost. It's not something that he can keep anymore. So again, it becomes a symbolic thing. Uh, that appointment is abandoned, in other words. The meeting was held without him, but now he had the piece of china, but how had the piece of china been broken into this remarkable shape? So again, look at the curiosity in his mind now. So the fact that he's missed the meeting with his constituents is the last thing he's thinking about at the moment. Instead, what is keeping him busy, what is making him obsessed is his desire to know how this particular uh, china was broken into, into this remarkable shape, five different shapes, irregular shapes. A careful examination put it beyond doubt that the star shape was accidental, which made it all the more strange, and it seemed unlikely that there should be another such in existence. So this very curious, strange, star ship like shape of this particular object was accidental. It was like an accident, it broke in a particular way, and hence this is a unique kind of a thing. You can't devise it, you can't really carve it out as it were. It had to be broken in a particular way, it had to be caused to an accident. So it's a fallout of an accident, which makes it very, very unique in quality. Set at the opposite end of the mantelpiece from the lump of glass that had been dug from the sand, it looked like a creature from another world, freakish and fantastic as a harlequin. So again, these words are very important, freakish, fantastic, harlequin. Now, as I mentioned a little while ago, uh, one can read this entire obsession with objects and to possess objects as some kind of a, a mimicry or a, a, you know, a repetitive mimicry of the original imperial fantasy of possessing exotic objects. Now, that original masculinist imperial fantasy is obviously a thing of the past here because of the setting of the story. Uh, so that is very conveniently parodied and mimicked and it becomes a bizarre uh, fetish, a bizarre irrational desire. But what it does, the entire story in that sense, what it does, it, it becomes a critique of this uh, masculinist uh, aspiration towards possession, this masculinist obsession for possession, for territorialization, for picking up land masses. So, you know, these objects which are like land masses, little pieces of land, little pieces of uh, matter, uh, they become the miniaturized versions of the little islands that were, you know, taken over during colonialism, the islands, the spaces, the, the vast land masses which were taken over during imperialism. So, you know, there is this mimicry of the original imperial narrative, the mimicry of the original Im imperial fantasy, which is a play here as well, right? So, because it's a mimic it almost sometimes has a comic effect, a dark comic effect, right? because that fantasy, that desire, that fetish is now a thing of the past. Now, to replicate it in the context of this time where the story is written, it almost always yields or generates a comic effect, which is something which we see. But as you can see, uh, looking at the object, looking at the lump uh, you know, that it's staring at, and feel that it's, like, it's a freakish and fantastic thing, like a harlequin. Harlequin obviously is a mimic artist, you know, it's an act of mimicry, and which obviously underlines uh, the mimicry quality of the story as well. But freakish and fantastic, these are again, uh, it's almost a rhetoric of imperialism, the rhetoric of the original imperial narrative, where everything outside 
of the ken of European imagination, everything outside the ken of the white male imagination becomes freakish and fantastic by default. It seemed to be pirating through space, winking light like a fitful star. The contrast between the china so vivid and alert and a glass so mute and contemplative, uh, contemplative fascinated him. And wondering and amazed, he asked himself how the two came to exist in the same world, let alone to stand upon the same narrow strip of marble in the same room. The question remained unanswered. So again, look at the way in which the two objects are, are contrasted with each other in the man's mind. Now, the interesting thing over here for us to understand is that the objects obviously don't speak. The objects are spoken to you, the objects are spoken for. So all these attributes that is given to the objects, the one is very vivid and alert and the other is mute and contemplative, well these are his readings or his projections onto these two objects. It's like picking up uh, in a very crude, vulgar, uh, imperialist sense, picking up two quote unquote natives from two different parts of the colony and contrasting them. One is virile, aggressive, you know, dominant, the other is submissive, docile and uh, passive. So it's like two imperial uh, you know, objects which are gazed at, which are being gazed at and a mantelpiece. And now the mantelpiece becomes uh, over here an imperial space as well because what we see very quickly and very clearly, this mantelpiece becomes uh, a museumized space where uh, different objects which are strange and freakish and outlandish and fantastic are put together and displayed, right? And that becomes almost like a museum space, a very symbolic miniaturized museum. Now, the whole idea of the museum was obviously part of the imperial fantasy that we pick up all these exotic objects from different parts of the world and put together uh, into this massive voyeuristic, uh, you know, uh, slideshow where you come and pay and, and consume it visually. Uh, and it obviously becomes uh, part of the uh, consumption uh, economy. Uh, now, what makes it complicated is obviously the entire idea, the entire, uh, the, the criterion to enter a museum is strangeness. Right? The criterion to enter a museum is uncanniness. So quite literally the museum becomes a space where the uncanny gets domesticated, where the uncanny becomes subjugated and is standardized and is displayed and consumed uh, in a very mainstream uh, way. Right? So you look at strange things in a museum. Uh, you look at the entire idea of the imperial museum is to have a gallery, uh, have a display, uh, sometimes very voyeuristic, uh, offering a very voyeuristic gaze. Uh, at very, very exotic objects. Uh, there's erotic quality about the museum as well in that sense. That you look at things uh, which are exotic, erotic in quality, which appeal to you. Now, we have this mantelpiece over here uh, becoming some kind of a quasi museum space as you can see. Okay, and now we find this fetish becomes uh, very, very prominent. The fetish becomes very, very uh, rampant in Joan's mind. He now began to haunt the places which are most prolific of broken China such as pieces of wasteland between railway lines. Again, look at the between quality of the spaces, between railway lines. Sites of demolished houses, again, abundant houses, demolished houses, and commons in a neighborhood of London. But China is seldom thrown from a great height. It is one of those rarest of human actions. You have to find in conjunction a very high house and a woman of such reckless impulse and passionate prejudice that she flings a jar or a pot straight from the window without thought of who is below. Now again, uh, this is interesting because look at the, uh, the focalization at work over here. Uh, the narrator, the gaze, the contemplative mind, the thinking mind is obviously very, very male and white male. So it is assumed immediately that a person who drops the object from the top must be a woman and obviously a reckless woman at that, probably possibly a hysterical woman, right? Someone who drops, uh, you know, uh, versus a channel from the top from a great height, uh, flings jars, a pot straight from the window, right? So broken jana was to be found in plenty, but broken in some trifling domestic accident with a purpose or character. Nevertheless, he was often uh, astonished as he came to go into the question more deeply by the immense variety of shapes to be found in London alone. And there was still more cause for wonder and, spe and speculation and the differences of qualities and designs. So, you know, there's this entire idea, the entire fetish with broken objects that he's beginning to grow. And not just objects which are abundant, but objects which are broken in a particular way. And the brokenness of each object gives, it, gives them a special, a unique kind of a design, a unique kind of a shape. So the design and shape and meaning that he has in his mind, this irrational private meaning that he has in his mind, uh, emerges out of the brokenness of objects. And that's something that we should pay some attention to. The finer specimens he would bring home and place upon his mantelpiece, where, however, the duty was more and more of an ornamental nature, since papers needing a weight to keep them down became scarcer 
and scarcer. So again, look, look at the shift of signifiers over here. The papers which are required, uh, the papers which wanted to be kept down with heavyweight, with paperweights, they became lesser and lesser and they became less and more and more you know, infrequent in that sense because he uh, stopped getting invitations, stopped being, he was not being taken very seriously. So all these subscriptions, invitations, you know, uh, office orders, uh, documents which were there in his mantelpiece before, uh, they began to disappear because obviously he's not, we can see that he's not really keen on his political ambitions anymore and he rather he moves towards his personal fetish for his broken objects. Uh, again the brokenness being the key ontological condition which uh, attracts them the, the, that forms his fetish in that sense. Right. So, again this very symbolic, uh, again this, this story is interesting because you need to look at the entire idea of things in the story, objects in the story, materials in the story and how the shift in materials, uh, the shift in the signifiers in materials, uh, they become uh, reflective in that sense of the shift of the human condition, the human state. Right? And this is something which we found throughout modernism ever since we started off with this first story, the Paris Master but to go on. We find even there materials and nature, they sort of correspond to the human mind and they are dialogic and reflective uh, the states of the human mind which is something we find here as well. We get you know, this whole idea that papers who, which needed a weight became more and more uh, scarce in quality because you know he was taken less and less seriously. And the, there is this list of um, you know, itemized list of things which he is neglecting. He neglected his duties perhaps or discharged them absentmindedly or his constituents when they visited him were unfavorably impressed by the appearance of his mantelpiece. So, the mantelpiece becomes this awkward sight over there because in a way uh, that uh, house the trash, that house the broken objects, that house the uh, discarded abandoned objects is not really uh, a meaningful museum in that sense. It becomes a meaningless museum but again like I said this becomes a mimicry of the original imperial museum where this whole obsession with objects and exotic objects were you know, displayed spectacularly. Right, that becomes a miniaturization, this mantelpiece becomes a parodic uh, miniaturization and mimicry of the original imperial museum, the imperial object space. At any rate, uh, he was not elected to represent them in parliament and his friend Charles taking it much to heart that, and, and hurrying to condole with him found him so little cast down by the disaster that he could only suppose that it was too serious a matter for him to realize all at once. So, we now come to the towards the end of the story. We are told very quickly that his political ambition, his political career was over, all but over. He did not get elected to the parliament because he started neglecting his duties, he started being uh, negligent towards his uh, political responsibilities, he did not answer his uh, constituents favorably, uh, his constituents were unimpressed with him. Uh, so, his political career was over and Charles his friend uh, began to get worried about him so he wanted to come and condole him. Right? Uh, but the funny thing is, the strange thing is he found that you know John was so little cast down, he was hardly depressed, he was hardly worried, he looked hardly worried. So, Charles thought on his uh, behalf that you know maybe you know this is too much a shock for him, it still has not it still has not sunk in in his mind right, it still has not uh, he still has not processed it the entire um, you know the fact that his career is over. In truth John had been that day to Barnes Common and there under a first bush had found a very remarkable piece of iron. It was almost identical with a glass in shape, massy and globular, but so cold and heavy, so black and metally that it was evidently alien to the earth and had its origin in one of those dead stars or was itself the cinder of a moon. So, he found a little piece of iron which is like almost uh, uh, you know celestial in quality. Uh, you know it may have come from some part of an asteroid you know, but then this is something which is completely fascinating him and that is what is consuming his imagination at the moment. It weighed his pocket down, it weighed the mantelpiece down, it radiated cold and here the meteorite stood upon the same ledge with a lump of glass and a star shaped china. So, again the whole uh, mantelpiece ledge now becomes full of this broken objects, discarded objects, abandoned objects and now we get this uh, almost meteorite, this little piece, little fragment from a meteor apparently. As his eyes passed from one to another, the determination to possess objects uh, that even surpassed those these tormented the young man. So, the, the fact the moment he looked at those objects, the determination, the fetish, the desire, uh, the fantasy to possess more objects began to consume him, it tormented him. He devoted himself more and more resolutely to the, to the search. If he had not been consumed by ambition and convinced that one day some newly discovered rubbish heap 
would reward him. The disappointments he had suffered, let alone the fatigue and derision, would have made him give up the pursuit. So now we find that you know the entire energy is spent now uh, picking up objects, and obviously along the way he's humiliated, insulted, mocked at, etc. But what keeps him going is the fact that he thinks that he's going to pick up some really important object. Uh, you know the fact that you will discover something you know, from some rubbish heap. Provided with a bag and a long stick fitted with an adaptable hook, now it becomes the perfect rack picker. So he goes with a bag and with a, with a stick and a hook, adaptable hook. Uh, he ransacked all deposits of earth, raked beneath matted uh, uh, tangles of scrub, searched all alleys and spaces between walls where he had learned to expect to find objects of this kind thrown away. So he becomes, uh, he begins to inhabit all the spaces, discarded spaces, abandoned spaces, decimated buildings, abandoned buildings, etc. Why is thinking of picking objects uh, of this kind? As the standards became higher and his taste more severe, the disappointments were innumerable, but always some gleam of hope, some piece of china or glass curiously marked a broken leered him on. So the whole idea of broken objects, that's what leers him on, right? So when um, the disappointments are massive, the derisions are massive, the mockery is massive, but what keeps him going essentially is the fact that he's driven towards picking up objects, collecting objects which are uh, you know, of a certain variety of brokenness. Day after day passed, he was no longer young. His career, that is his political career, was a thing of the past. His political career is over. He doesn't have any more political career anymore. People give up visiting him. He was too silent to be worth asking to dinner. He never talked to anyone about his serious ambitions. The lack of understanding was apparent in their behavior. So the whole idea, and this is something you can, if those of you remember uh, the James Joyce short story which we did, Araby, uh, we find that, you know, it has a very interesting inversion of the values and the valueless world. So, uh, the whole wait for Mangan's sister in that story was the only serious thing to do. When everything else around him, the adult world around him became child's play. Right? It's an inversion of the erotic world and the adult world. So, the private erotic fantasy world that becomes the only meaningful world, a person, only meaningful world worth waiting for. Whereas everything else, uh, the uncle coming back, the, the school teachers uh, admonishing him for not doing his homework, all this become child's play. Now, similarly, there is some kind of an irrational inversion here as well, a quote unquote irrational inversion. Uh, you know, his political career, his uh, mockeries of his constituents, uh, the, the fact that his ambition was over, uh, all his important political decisions and readers which he had subscribed before were all done and dusted, all these did not matter to him at all, right? So, uh, his only serious ambition, his only worthy ambition in his mind, the only noble ambition in his mind was to go and keep picking up more, more and more broken objects, uh, discarded objects, uh, which would then feed his fantasy uh, of collecting and gathering and having his fetish towards brokenness, right? Uh, and obviously, he failed to connect to other people, he failed to socialize, he failed to establish any empathetic relationship with his friends or fellow constituents. He leaned back in his chair now and watched Charles lift the stones from the mantelpiece a dozen times and put them down emphatically to mark what he was saying about the conduct of the government without once noticing their existence, right? So obviously Charles and John are having a conversation but the drifting about Charles is talking about the conduct uh, of the government. Uh, but he, John notices that Charles is talking to him by picking up the stones but not really noticing them because those are worth not worth noticing by Charles, uh, by Charles's imagination because Charles at this point is an important serious politician. He's talking about policies and narratives and government decisions etc. So all these objects in the mantelpiece that he sees which belongs to John which obviously John picked up from different trash bins and different parts of abandoned spaces in London. Uh, those objects don't appeal to him at all. He's picking them up indiscriminately randomly while talking about more quote unquote serious things, right? What was the truth of it, John? asked Charles suddenly, turning and facing him. What made you give it up all up and all that in a second? Right. So now he asks this direct blunt question, why did you give up a political career? Uh, you had it, you were on the brink of getting elected. What, what made you give up everything in one go? I've not given it up, John replied. Now obviously the, they're, they're talking in cross purposes over here. There's some dramatic irony that uh, is at play because we the audience know one of them knows uh, the truth, but obviously they are at um, complete confusion with each other in terms of what they're saying and what they're responding to. Because Charles is asking John, why did he give up on your project? Now, what he doesn't know is that John now 
has a different project and this project is to collect broken objects to find the perfect pieces which will form together one museum, one, one spectacular you know, area, one spectacular space of broken objects uh, which form his fetish. That is his only ambition. So he hasn't given up on that ambition. He still goes to broken spaces, he still goes to abandoned spaces, he still goes to wasteland and he keeps driving himself all, all, the, all the time there. So his entire career, his entire ambition is not driven towards that. And obviously Charles doesn't know yet. Charles is asking why did he give up your ambition to which John responds I have not given it up. John replied but if not, you've not got a ghost of a chance now said Charles roughly you know you've given up I mean no one takes you seriously you know your political career is all over uh, there's no seriousness left in your political profile you don't have a chance anymore. I don't agree with you there said John with conviction. So again this conviction comes from something else because he's focused entirely uh, on something else nothing to do with politics at all. He's obviously talking about collecting objects, picking up broken objects that is his conviction at play. So he says I don't agree with you there said John with conviction. Charles looked at him and was profoundly uneasy. The most extraordinary uh, doubts possessed him. He had a queer sense that they were talking about different things. So now this becomes obvious to Charles that maybe he is asking a different set of questions and John is responding having a different set of things in mind. He looked around to find some relief for this horrible depression but the disorderly appearance of the room depressed him even further. So the word disorderly is interesting because it becomes the architecture of irrationality that uh, John is exhibiting, right? So the entire weird museum as such where everything is like disorderly and broken and incommensurate with each other. Uh, that becomes uneasy for Charles because Charles is obviously the mainstream, uh, the, the consumer of mainstream uh, progressive or progress driven narrative. Right? Whereas, uh, you know, John over here is sort of trying to fall back upon some kind of a strange narrative, the uncanny narrative of broken objects. So, there is this horrible depression that he is experiencing and looking at the disorderly appearance depresses him even further. What was at stake and the long carpet bag hanging against the wall. So again the stick and a carpet bag which are traditionally the rack pickers instruments they are staring at him they are hanging in the wall and that disturbs him even further you know uh, Charles gets more disturbed. And then these stones looking at John something fixed and distant in his expression alarmed him. He knew only too well that his main appearance upon a platform was out of the question. So he knows that this is there is a spectral quality about John is already dead politically. Uh, the very appearance on, his, on a platform, on a political platform was out of question entirely because John obviously doesn't have it anymore. He's driven towards something else that he, Charles doesn't quite understand. Uh, there's something uncanny, strange, almost supernatural about him which is beginning to make him uncomfortable, perhaps a little scared also. Pretty stones, he said as cheerfully as he could and saying that he had an appointment to keep, he left John forever. So, the, the final image also one of abandon, he abandoned John forever, right? So, you know everything is abandoned, uh, John's political career is abandoned by himself, Charles abandons John and John obviously uh, creates a fetish or forms a fetish out of collecting abandoned objects. So, in that sense the iron, the, 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 the title story is very, very ironic in quality, solid objects, there is nothing solid about it, they are broken objects and out of those broken objects John is trying to form a fetish and like you said uh, that irrational desire to collect broken objects becomes in a way a mockery or a mimicry of the original imperial fantasy of collecting precious stones, of grabbing lands, of possessing exotic objects, of territorializing unknown territories. So, there is little shards of glass, little pieces of lump that it carries, little landmasses and obviously miniaturized versions of the original big landmasses that imperial imagination and fantasy projected themselves to. So, this story could be seen interestingly as a reputation uh, or a deflated reputation, a, a, a mimicry uh, of the original imperial narrative, the masculinist narrative of possession, ownership, fetish, greed, etc. Only uh, this is relocated in a different time uh, with that, you know, the, that original imperial movement is gone and this is post First World War uh, and you know we have this entire idea of broken objects otherwise. Uh, so, instead of the imperial objects with the broken objects. So, John becomes in a way strangely uh, collusive to an original imperial fantasy which obviously does not work anymore. So, he has a shift from the gentleman to the rack picker which is a very symbolic shift which takes place in the story. So, as you can see this is a very bizarre irrational story, but what does bizarre irrational quality of the story does? It becomes a very interesting critique of the politics and culture of consumption in modernity, right? So, John's obsession with objects becomes a commentary on the irrational obsession of objects uh, and materiality in modernity which is also 
uh, an extension of the original imperial fantasy about objects, right? And we have this imperial moments in the story as well. Uh, this idea of this dark woman uh, driven by slaves, uh, this idea of you know some exotic object somewhere as, as a precious stone out of an Elizabethan treasure box, etc. So all these like are very very standard signifiers of imperial fantasy, imperial loot, uh, imperial uh, you know exploration. Right, and that kind of an imperial imagination is extended in John's uh, embodiment here as well, only in a grotesque parodic form. So this story uh, is obviously about human consciousness, is about human thought processes, but also it gives a very, very uh, queer and very interesting and uncomfortable idea of masculinity, uh, white British post-imperial masculinity, uh, as it begins to crack up. So this is a very interesting story for those of you interested in masculinity studies and also thing theory, as I mentioned, because. What happens in a story is uh, the, the thingness of objects, the post value, the post purpose quality of objects, those are the things that get uh, foregrounded uh, and you know those are the things that they talked about actually and that obviously uh, you know is an exhaustion of functionality and exhaustion of significance that is a play away yeah? because you know these are objects which are you know just exhausted the object status and that becomes an irrational desire of possession uh, for this particular white male imagination which makes it a very interesting retelling as was a mimicry of an original imperial narrative of possession and fantasy and fetish. So with that we end uh, this short series sorted objects go back and read it again if you have any questions please forward those in the online forum that we have and we have to engage with them in due course of time. So with that we finish this and we move on to new text which will start in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.